Good morning, church. Welcome to April and to this wonderful, glorious day. I am especially glad to be here with you. I hope that you feel the same way. 1 Corinthians 13 is one of the most familiar and beloved passages in the entire Bible, especially verses 4 to 7, the, the part about love is patient, love is kind, etc. And, and uh, there are many that think that may have, in fact, been a hymn of the early church. It, it's often titled the love chapter. And you've heard it, as I have, recited at weddings, uh, even at weddings by non-Christians. Uh, there are innumerable posters and wall art and Pinterest postings and various other artistic expressions that portray the words of this chapter for display in your home or on your website or wherever. It is, this chapter has been called the greatest literary passage in the Bible. In fact, some have called it the greatest literary passage in all of Western civilization. But many people, um, perhaps most people, I'm not, I don't know, the people who adore the poetry of this chapter, including many in the church, have no clue why Paul would put this passage in his letter to the Corinthian church. And they especially don't understand why it's placed where it is in this letter. More than a few biblical scholars have suggested that it's out of place, that it must have been moved from a different place in a manuscripts to its current location from where it was originally. But let me assure you that Paul knew exactly what he was doing when he wrote this chapter and when he placed it right here. And if we want to understand what Paul meant, we need to understand a few things, three things in particular. We need to know, first of all, the problems that were going on in the church in Corinth. We need to know, secondly, the setting of this chapter in Paul's letter. And thirdly, we need to know the meaning of this Greek word agape, which is translated love, or in the old King James, charity. So let's get a little background on this church. Why is it having so problem? the problems that it is? Paul actually founded this church. Acts 18 describes for us Paul's initial arrival in Corinth when he began preaching the gospel in the synagogue and then left the synagogue and began dedicating himself to ministering to and reaching the Gentiles in the city. And Paul spent about two years there in Corinth establishing the church, and then he continued after he left to write to the church. He continued to visit several times in order to help them, to help them develop and to deal with the problems that they were having. But the church in Corinth was a mess. There's, there's really no way to sugarcoat it or to put it politely. They had a boatload of problems. Uh, but actually, that's a help for you and me because we now have two books of the New Testament, two letters of Paul, that show us how he dealt with their problems. And so we have God's answer for the church's problems to help us deal when we have problems in church. Anyone figured out yet you've been in church long enough to know that church has problems, right? Okay, so we don't have any newbies. That's good. All right, but the church in Corinth was a mess, and they, and they had three major problems that stood out above all of the other problems. The first was that the church was sharply divided. There were factions among the church. Each of these factions devoted to following a particular pastor, leader, teacher person, Paul or Apollos or, or Peter, and some who were devoted to their own particular understanding of what Jesus had shared with them through the Spirit, through special revelation, or so they claimed. And so there are these sharp conflicts among these various groups, particularly when it came to assessing, well, who is this Paul guy and what's his status and are we sure he's an apostle and what does he have to say to us and what's his authority in this church? And the church was divided in other ways, not just among these factions. There, there were divisions that were based on the very ordinary distinctions that defined the social order of life in the Greco-Roman world. So there was a division in Corinth between the rich and the poor. There was a division between the freemen and the slaves. There appears to have been a division between those who were Jewish or identified with Judaism, like the God-fearers, and those who were raw Gentiles and unconcerned about the practices or the customs of the Jews. And so all of these divisions in the church were preventing the Corinthians from maturing in their faith and was hindering them from fulfilling their mission. Well, secondly, those divisions were connected to a second problem. And that was this, the church was living according to the ways of the surrounding culture instead of living according to the ways of Christ. 
in their morality, in their worship, in their treatment of one another, in their identity as a group, the Corinthians reflected the life and the thinking and the habits and, and the customs and the assumptions of the pagan world or of the synagogue rather than reflecting what Christ and Paul and the other apostles had taught. And it showed up in every aspect of their lives, both in terms of their lives individually and in terms of their lives as a corporate group together as a church. And that led to a third problem, because the divisions in the church and the fact that they are living in conformity to the cultural mores and the customs, that all gets exacerbated by the fact that the Corinthians had either adopted or developed a very warped view of what it meant to be spiritual. And consequently, despite the fact that they had great spiritual gifts and they were a very gifted group, they, and they grasped some of the aspects of what it meant to follow Christ, their public worship was neither spiritual nor reflective of the presence of the living God among his people. It, it was chaotic, it was disorderly, and it was marred by a total misunderstanding of the point of being Christians, of, of the point of being the church. So all three of these problems are important for understanding chapter 13 in Paul's letter to the church in Corinthians. So let's start by noting where it's placed, because the setting of chapter 13 matters a great deal. You see, in chapters 11 to 14, Paul is addressing the problems that are all associated with their public worship. Chapters 11 to 14 all deal with the main topic of the church at worship. And he is addressing problems that are coming up in their public worship. So he discusses a number of issues in these four chapters. He, he talks, for instance, about the, the importance of showing propriety and modesty in their dress. He commands them to make sure that make sure you're not flaunting your freedom in Christ in a way that's going to shock and scandalize people from outside or, for that matter, people in the church. Their worship, he says, their worship needs to be something that, that, that isn't marked by disregard for common decency and isn't marked by a disregard for, for decorum. He also reminds them that when they take communion together, the presence of the Lord is there among them at, and, and in the church as a whole body, that there's a presence of God in their corporate coming together that's different just than his presence in them individually. And so when they take communion, they need to honor the Lord and his presence by recognizing that everyone who's here as part of the body belongs to the body of Christ, that all who belong to Christ are fundamentally equal no matter what their social status is in the outside world. The outside world had a very sharply stratified cultural uh, uh, set of, of levels. You, you, if you were in one of those levels, you couldn't move up. And everything in life was determined by where you were in those levels. And, and Paul says the church doesn't live like that. The church can't live according to the social and the cultural barriers. They have to break through the habits, the presumptions that govern life in the world outside. And so the social distinctions, dis, excuse me, distinctions of class and race and status and family, whatever else would mark someone in the wider culture, all of that had to be discarded in order to recognize their fundamental equality and their union as fellow members of the body of Christ. And then Paul insists that these gifts of the Holy Spirit that are distributed among the church, they have a very singular purpose. And that purpose is to build up the whole body so that everyone is helped to grow spiritually. And the ways in which the Holy Spirit manifests the power of God and the presence of God and the way he speaks to his people, these are always intended to strengthen the body as a whole, not to elevate one individual, not to elevate a faction in the church. And Paul, fourthly, he, he insists the church has to recognize that there's diversity in its members. He says, if, if the whole body's an eye, how are you going to hear anything? And so all the ways in which each member is different from the others, this is our diversity, and that's a reminder that each member is important, that each member has something to contribute, that each member is needed, and that what each one contributes matters for the health 
and the overall well-being of the entire church. So though we are different, we are united in this. As we follow Jesus together, as we acknowledge his lordship over us, his spirit is building us into a dwelling place for the spirit of God, for the presence of God. And everything that we do matters. So in this extended four chapters section, it's dealing with the Corinthians with their public worship, Paul inserts this marvelous little chapter to point out what he calls a more excellent way, the way of agape, the way of love. And it is this way that's going to solve all of these problems that the Corinthians were having. The way that the church needed to follow, instead of following the cultural trends, instead of following their own personal preferences and their own personal desires. So what is agape? Now, you may have heard this before, but let me just repeat it. The Greek language, different than English, had four different distinct terms for describing four different kinds of love. The first is eros. Eros is sexual or romantic love. It's love that was characterized by desire, by the desire to obtain pleasure or to obtain or someone else. Uh, storge is the second uh, word, and storge is familial love, the kind of a love that a parent has for a child, family members for one another. The third word was philos, and philos was brotherly love, the kind of close affection that's shared by friends who have common interests and, and uh, common affection for one another and for the things that they do. The fourth term, agape, it's actually a word that was not used very much before the Christian era. Um, but it became the special term that Christians used to talk about love that they had experienced. It was their characteristic word. So for instance, in the New Testament, we never see the words eros or storge. There are a couple of words that are the opposite of storge. We, we see philos a number of times, but agape is the predominant word that's used more than any other word for love in the New Testament. Now, in its ordinary usage, that is pre-Christian or outside the church, agape describes a love that's characterized by choice. It's, it's an, an intellectual, uh, intellectually motivated love. It is not a function of the emotions. It's not a feeling. It is a matter of the mind and the will. It reflects the desire to give to one another, to give to someone else. So Paul and the other apostles used agape to describe the love that God has for us because he demonstrated it for us supremely in the sacrificial death of Christ on the cross. Agape is love for the undeserving. It is love for the unworthy. Love that is lavished upon them without any consideration for merit or repayment. It's just given. Agape proceeds from the nature of the lover, not from the beloved. It isn't motivated by, oh, I'm going to get something back from the other one. It's not motivated by the desire to obtain. It's not motivated by the desire to find pleasure. It's motivated by the desire to give. Agape seeks nothing for itself, only for the good of the loved one. And so because agape is a choice, a decision, it is not a feeling, because of that, it can be commanded. And so Jesus commands his disciples to love one another, agapao, the verb form. Because it's not a feeling that you fall into, it is a love you choose. A love you choose. Put simply, agape is a love that is the choice to act in order to obtain the very highest possible good for the loved one. It is a choice to give sacrificially at cost to myself regardless of whether or not the person is deserving or can repay, because it isn't considering any of those things. It is the love that God has for us that we experience from him and which we are then commanded to show to one another and to the world, even to our enemies. 
And this way of love, this way of agape, is what Paul says the Corinthians needed to follow. It is what they needed to choose if they were going to overcome their divisiveness, their focus on their own ideas of what a spiritual worship service looked like, and their conformity to the ways of the world around them. Because the way of the kingdom is and has always been the way of agape. Now, in point of fact, Paul has already begun to address this earlier in the letter. In chapters 8 and 9, for instance, he laid out the principle by which he lived, and he calls on the Corinthians to adopt that same principle. And so instead of insisting on having his rights respected, instead of insisting that they meet his needs, Paul insisted on laying down his rights, laying down his privileges, and told them to stop taking offense at the fact that he wouldn't let them pay him. And he said, I'm, I'm, I'm insisting that you allow me to deny my rights, deny my privileges in order to serve. He insisted on being allowed to serve rather than insisting that they serve him. He insisted on being allowed to pour out his life to seek the best for them because that's the way of love, and he wanted to model that for him. He had demonstrated his love for them throughout his two years of time with them, and now he's explaining to them why it matters so much, why it ought to be the one thing that characterized the church above all other things. This is the most excellent way. This is what I want you to follow. Now, just a few verses before Paul started chapter 13, he makes a very remarkable statement, a statement that's crucial for us to understand as we think about what the church ought to look like in this way of agape, because in chapter 12, 24, last half of 24 to 27, we read these words. He's at the end of his talking about how God has, has arranged the members of the body. He says, but God has put the body together, giving greater honor to the parts that lacked it, so that there should be no division in the body, but that its parts should have equal concern for each other. If one part suffers, every part suffers with it. If one part is honored, every part rejoices with it. Now you are the body of Christ, and each one of you is a part of it. Now we usually read that passage and we think, okay, we're supposed to care for those who are suffering as if we were suffering right along with them. And, and that's a fair way to read that text. Paul specifically mentions the need to be concerned for one another, so that would follow. But I think Paul also has a deeper point to make, one that's based on a deeper understanding of what it means to be part of the body of Christ. Because Paul is describing a spiritual reality, a spiritual truth. He's not just giving an exhortation. I discovered this after years of thinking about the suffering church around the world. And the point is actually quite simple, but it's quite profound. It is this. Because you and I are a part of the body of Christ, because we as a congregation are a part of the body of Christ, because we are spiritually connected with one another through our relationship to Christ, if another part of the body of Christ is suffering, we suffer as well. If they are thriving, we are blessed as well. We are affected spiritually by what happens to them, whether or not we realize it and whether or not we can measure it. So when the suffering church is hurting around the globe, you and I are diminished in some way that we can't exactly measure and may not recognize, but it's real. And when the suffering church or any other church is thriving and God is blessing them, we are helped even when we can't see it or measure it. And if that's true of the worldwide church, and I am convinced it is absolutely true, how much more is it true of a single congregation? We are affected by what affects the others in the congregation. And whether you recognize that their suffering affects you or not isn't the issue. And whether or not you were a part of the cause for that suffering is irrelevant because you're still affected. We're all still affected. Now, our church has been through a lot of stuff in the very recent past. Some very real suffering, some very painful times due to some conflict over some very sharp divisions. Some of that conflict 
was the result of the very natural conflict that occurs when there's one group that's trying to walk in God's ways and another group that wants to follow the culture or follow the popular trends of the day or, or their own personal preferences. And, and those conflicts, that kind of conflicts, can never be resolved apart from people coming to repentance and choosing to leave the ways of the world behind and follow Christ. In other words, if you're following Christ, you're always going to have conflict with people who don't want to follow Christ. That's just always going to be the case. If I want to live according to what the Bible teaches, then I'm going to be in conflict with people who think the Bible is irrelevant to today. And, and we can't fix that kind of conflict. But some of the conflict has been due to personal failings, our personal failings, our corporate failings. I'm not interested in rehearsing those conflicts. I'm not interested in rehashing that history. Can't change what happened. And, and as far as I'm concerned, I, I think it's just the truth. Trying to find out who we can blame is pointless and, and unhelpful. But I do think, however, that it's important that we acknowledge the reality of that history and the reality of that suffering and that pain. And we ask God to search our own hearts to see, Lord, is there anything in us that needs to be confessed? Is there anything in me that I need to do to make things right? Is there anything that we should do as a whole to make things right? To the extent that that's possible, Paul says to Romans, as far as it's possible with you, be at peace with all people. Sometimes it's not possible. You do all that you can, and that's all you can do. There have also been some divisions, not in the recent past, but conflicts that are much older. During my very brief time here, I've been listening to leaders. I've been listening to you, listening to people sharing. I've done a little bit of research, and I've been listening to the Holy Spirit. And I discovered something, and I became convinced that the reason we have two services is not because there were so many people coming to church that First Christian had to start a second service to get everybody in the sanctuary. The reason First Christian has had two services for decades now is that there's been an unhealed conflict, an unhealed conflict over musical preferences, over styles of worship in the form of the liturgy. And so what has happened is that the two services have been primarily characterized by a rejection of the other way of worshiping, and by extension, therefore, a rejection of those people who choose or prefer that way of worship. And the result is that we have effectively become two congregations. So what should we do? Well, that's what the church leadership has been asking and discussing and praying about for some time now. And the elders and the trustees, the worship leaders, the children's ministry leader met with me at a retreat in February We've continued to carefully and prayerfully consider this question. And we're convinced that it's absolutely crucial for the present and the future health of our church that we recommit to being one congregation, that we recommit to being one church. And here's the very first thing we're going to do toward that end. <clears throat> we are going to build on the great experience that we had last week with our fifth Sunday brunch. Okay? We had a great time, and if you missed it, I am really sorry. I, there's no way we can replicate that, but we're going to try. We are going to eat together. We are going to have an Easter breakfast feast. The men of this church, yeah. <clears throat> the men of this church, at least some of the men, are going to cook a fantastic Easter breakfast for us. And the ladies will love it since they won't have to cook anything. And the men will love it since the women won't be in the kitchen telling them how to do it the right way. <clears throat> it's going to be great. <laughs> And we want you to be there. We want you to enjoy eating together, and we want to show off our manly cooking skills. So on Easter morning, in two weeks, from 8.30 to 9.30, we're going to gather together in the fellowship hall for an Easter feast to celebrate our unity as a church. And by the way, this isn't a new thing, though it may become a new tradition for us, I hope. Throughout the ages, the, the church has celebrated Resurrection Sunday as a feast, and the idea goes clear back to Jesus himself, eating with his disciples and eating with sinners. And to the early church, you celebrate it every Sunday with a love feast. And, and throughout the history of the church, the Easter celebration was always considered the greatest feast of the entire church year. Now, David Akins is going to lead the men who are cooking. David, stand up real quick for those who don't know you. David, <clears throat> I, I asked David to lead this because he was my boss when I was a painter and a young kid. And I've, I've watched him lead a crew. He knows how to lead a crew. So he's going to lead the men who are cooking and serving and cleaning, by the way, guys. And, and we need, yeah, that's right. And we need, Dave's like, I didn't sign up for that. <laughs> you, can, you can delegate that, Dave, that's all right. We need plenty of volunteers. So if you want to help, find David or call him and let him know you want to help. And if you can't find him, 
Just call the church office. We'll put you in touch. We'll let them know you want to help out. Okay? And because we're having breakfast together that morning, we won't have our discipleship groups as we regularly do that morning. Okay? So that's the first thing we're going to do. The second thing we're going to do is that we're going to recommit to being a single congregation by this. Right after our Easter breakfast feast, we're going to worship together. We're going to go straight from fellowship and feasting to worship. So from 9.45 to 11 o'clock on Easter morning, we're going to have a single combined worship service to celebrate Resurrection Sunday. And we're going to take the best of both services, and we're going to blend them together into a worship service that expresses as best we know how what a united church's worship looks like. We'll have special music, including some traditional FCC pieces that you're going to love, some newer songs, a blend of contemporary and traditional styles of music, literature. We are going to celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ and the resurrection of First Christian Church as a single congregation. <clears throat> but we're not going to stop there. Because beginning with Easter, we're going to continue to have a single combined worship service. Our worship time will be from 9.45 to 11. Both services are going to give, okay? Why don't you just meet me in the middle? That's what we do. Okay. So our goal is to have a blended worship that combines elements from our traditional service and from our contemporary service. And discipleship groups are going to have the option of meeting before, from 8.45 to 8.35, or after worship. It'll be up to the leaders and the participants to decide well, which time works best for you. Now, please understand, there's still a lot of details we have to figure out, and we're probably going to have some hiccups along the way as we make this change. But our goal is very clear, and our goal is very sure. We, we are committed to being one church and one congregation, and the leadership of this church is united on this point. And we're going to find a way to worship together that expresses the heart of that united congregation and allows each of us to find something in our worship experience that expresses our own heart for the Lord. So I've invited two of our leaders this morning to come and share a bit more about this transition to let you hear from their heart, their thoughts, their convictions about the process and the decision to make this change. And then next week, there's going to be a little bit more sharing so that you can hear from more than one voice what we believe we've heard from God. So Dennis uh, Hayward, where are you? Come on up. Dennis is going to go first, and then Judy Chadwick's going to share, and I'll have a couple final thoughts right at the end. Good morning. We are very grateful God sent us Barry and Mary. Amen. Wonderful. <clears throat> For those who don't know me, my name's listed right up there. I'm Dennis Hayward. And um, I'm one of the uh, folks that uh, you all kind-heartedly decided to vote to help sit down and, and uh, talk and make decisions for the church on occasion. I want to take a few minutes this morning just to give you some ideas of what we've been doing. But I think first, and more importantly, is to thank all of you for your patience. You know, you've allowed us time to meet, to pray, to formulate objectives for our church in a very graceful manner. And that, you don't know how much that means to all of us. We can't, we can't do this without all of your support. Well, as Pastor Barry had said, the elders, pastor, music ministry, trustees, and staff have been meeting the past few months in retreat and also special meetings in our regular, regular meetings to search for solutions that helped us and help us to focus on the mission of the church and bring us closer together as a family. Prayer has been, and still is, our main ally through all the discussions. We spent considerable time in prayer to hear what God was saying to our hearts. We developed a parking lot list of ideas and challenges and then set out to get out to make some sense of our brainstorming um, and sent to put it into a sense of order. We knew we needed a starting point, so we prioritized our ideas to help us focus on the immediate road ahead. We all agreed our main priority was to build upon our church's mission, gather, grow, and go. In other words, to make disciples in Christ. An important element of this goal is unity. We want, <clears throat> we want and pray we can do the things necessary to bring our church family closer. So this actually became a focal point 
as we begin to take these steps forward. So what did we kind of focus on during these meetings? Well, obviously, I think Pastor Barry said it very well. Our, we, we had discussions for maintaining the status quo. Do we just want to continue going down the same road that we were going, or do we want to consider consolidating services? And we thought by consolidation, we were going to help meet the, meet the objectives that we had just mentioned before. We knew we'd have to work and make decisions from limited resources, so our idea was to do our planning with positive spirit in gratitude for what he has provided. A promise to all of you, we will manage our resources closely and operate as efficiently as possible and still accomplish the goals of FCC with all of your help. Prayerful evenings were spent in lively discussion of worship service times. I'm sure you would have liked to have been there. Bible study groups, fellowship time, worship service music type and styles, child care, among numerous other things, with a focus on ways to enhance our relationships rather than create the bridge rather than trying to divide. All our ideas were fleshed out, both pro and con, and we gave equal time to prayer, asking for support and answers. With God's help, our prayers were answered. The unanimous decision was made to combine the services. We trust this step will help bring us closer together. Now, on a personal note here, too, I had to continually remind myself that fear can be twofold, and I need to be diligent in acknowledging the difference in the two types of fear. The first is God-given, and it helps protect me. The second, the spirit of fear, is from Satan and is designed to place me in spiritual bondage, not allowing me to hear the full word of God. I do not want to hear, I do not want to fear a, a change to be the cause of my inaction on, or on my part, and I'm very excited to move forward. Paul says in 2 Timothy 1.7, For God gave us a spirit, not of fear, but of power and love and self-control. We need to listen to our hearts, be humble, and stay together during all of our times, whether they be up or they be down. Isaiah in chapter 26, verses 3 and 4. You keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on you, because he trusts in you. Trust in the Lord forever, for the Lord God is an everlasting rock. I feel very positive about the decisions that we've made and hopefully brought forward and can uh, bring us closer together. And with that, uh, I'll close. Thank you, Dennis. Yes. Judy? Good morning, my brothers and sisters in Christ. We are a church family and part of the body of Christ. And I love this church body. And it has been a major part of my life since we moved to Lawrence in 1984. Today, I want to talk to you about two things, the immediate future and the recent past. Over the years, I've been able to use my musical talents in various ways here at First Christian. But my role for the past one and a half years has been to plan and play for the traditional service each week. I love my role of leading worship through music. And accompanying hymns and playing my individual pieces is my worship offering to my Lord. I sing and praise to God through my fingers. And I have heard that many of you are helped in your own worship through my fingers. I'm comfortable with my role, but now for the good of the whole church family, God is asking me to be more of a team player. Both Greg and I will now uh, collaborate on putting together our one unified service. I admit that there are many unknowns and there will be new challenges for me to use skills that I've not needed to use for the recent past. Greg and Pastor Barry and I have been talking much about this goal of one unified service which will help us all to worship together. I feel that it is an exciting time in the life of our church, and change, as Dennis pointed out, can be fearful, but change can also bring new life and enthusiasm. What do we need from you 
a willingness to change a little bit, like an hour and a quarter service. That's not a bad change, is it? <laughs> Patience, while well, we try different ideas, like more congregational participation and encouragement and support for our efforts to minister to all of our church family through additional musical styles. I ask you to trust Greg, who is a godly man and a very, very fine musician with a wealth of musical background and leadership experiences. I look forward to working closely with him and learning from him. I ask you to trust Pastor Barry, whom I see as a gift from God for this congregation. I ask you to pray for me as I approach unknowns and challenges that will stretch me musically. And pray for the leaders, the elders who oversee this wonderful family of believers and completely support who completely support the need of our coming together in one worship service. And pray that the Holy Spirit will guide and bless each one of us as we move forward into the future. Now, speaking of moving forward, I have a story to tell you about what God has been and is currently doing in my own life. I have realized that in order to move forward, I need to deal with the hurt that began three years ago. Through the wise and perceptive care of Pastor Barry, he recently suggested that I needed to work on forgiving those involved in causing my deep hurt for the past three years. The prayer of Jesus as he hung on the cross was, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. I am in still in the midst of this process of forgiving sp specific people who caused or added to the chaotic and disappointing losses for me personally and for our church. It seems that as I pray specifically, God continues to bring other people or situations to my mind. So the process of forgiving is ongoing for me. Jesus also said to bless those that persecute you. So now I'm beginning to ask for God's blessing on those wherever they are. Perhaps some of you this morning are still dwelling on hurts of the past. I invite you to join with me in forgiving past offenses of word or deed by individuals or groups of people. In order to move forward, we must forgive and bless them. Jesus also said, if you forgive others when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others that's their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. Thank you. Thank you.